Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Detroit Institute of Arts Thursdays at the Museum program. I'm Amanda Harrison, a Community Engagement Manager with the DIA. Thank you for joining us for this very special presentation designed in celebration of Black History Month. We have a whole host of programs this month, so please check them out on our website, dia.org slash Black History Month. Previous Thursdays at the Museum programs are available on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash user slash Detroit Institute of Arts. During the program, I'd like to encourage you, as always, to ask questions. You can do so by selecting the Q&A icon on the right-hand side of the top of your screen and compose your questions anonymously. Questions will be read on screen by our newest moderator, Kimmy Dobos wolf Christine Mark will be returning next week. Today, we're joined by our valued hosts and trained docents, Ray Honey, Cindy Patrick, and Jim O'Malley, with a very special guest, DIA curator, Dr. Kwaku Pom. Ni Kwaku Pom is the curator of African art and the department head of Africa, Oceanic, and Indonesia, Indonesia's Americas. Please give our hosts a warm welcome. Hello. Um, hello, everybody. This is Ray Henney. Um, I am uh, the vi uh, vice uh, or the co-chair of the IPV or docent committee for the uh, DIA. And today is a real treat for myself and for Cindy and Jim. We are so excited to have Dr. Nee with us to be presenting this virtual tour concerning a very important aspect of the DIA's African art collection. Dr. Nee is a favorite with our DIA docents. Um, he patiently and enthusiastically provides us with extensive training on the collection, and his enthusiasm is contagious. One of the first lessons that we learn is that the pieces in the African collection are not created to be simply a work of art or accurately represent the way things may look in nature. Instead, African art is functional. It is created to create and achieve a, a goal or a purpose. You know, that purpose can be religious, spiritual, social, or political. It is intended to evoke emotions and meaning to facilitate that purpose. It is our great pleasure to have Dr. Nee with us. Dr. Nee? Hello. Um, I am so delighted to um, be speaking alongside um, my favorite IPVs today. And to, my topic today is on African masks or African masquerades. In much of sub-Saharan Africa, um, the mask is not just a face covering. It is not just a disguise. It is much more. While some African masks entertain, and of course most masks might entertain, most have crucial religious, social, and political functions. Masks in cultures that produce masks and use them can be vehicles by which spirits manifest themselves. And in those cultures, the masks are made specifically to provide a boat for those spirits. And these spirits include ancestral spirits, include deities, as well as nature spirits. Because spirits can take a boat in the masks, the masks, when performed, become an opportunity for humans to interact and sometimes even negotiate with spirits. A spirit that temporarily inhabits a mask can also possess its wearer, momentarily transforming that wearer. So sometimes we say the person who is wearing the mask is no longer him or herself. Masked characters may impart secret knowledge or transmit messages through their utterances 
and actions. So for many African cultures, masking is a serious affair. A mask may also possess coercive power, making it a tool for law enforcement. Um, some masks have policing functions too. Masks can also be political tools designed to validate or legitimize leadership authority. Next slide. The African masks on view in many museum galleries often lack many critical components. I say so because African masquerades are multi-sensory experiences. The, the masks that we see in glass cases on mounts are generally incomplete. Most of them lack their original costumes, which were stripped of them by their collect. More importantly, they have been taken out of their original context of use, robbing them of their accompanying music and sometimes rituals. The wearer's move, movements and theatrics, as well as utterances, and sometimes even interactions with the audience are also missing in our galleries. Therefore, it is better to talk about masquerade performance rather than about masks. The object is not as important as the ceremony. The ceremony that accompanies the wearing of that object is what is critical in African cultures. Because it is by so doing that Africans come into contact with spirits, that they are able to negotiate and control spirits, that they are able to sometimes even listen for utterances from spirits. So at the DIA, we have tried to use videos of African masks in performances in our gallery to offer the Vista insights into the dynamic masquerade experience. I look forward to seeing some of you in the African gallery because if you have time, come to the DI and experience the masquerade in our galleries. Next. Cindy, um, speaking of, thank you so much, Dr. Nee, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Cindy, uh, speaking of ceremony, uh, do you want to introduce and talk about this next work? I sure would. Thanks, Ray. And thank you, Dr. Nee, for building a wonderful foundation for me to begin talking about this very first mask. Uh, the, uh, the name of the mask is, is an Egungun mask, and you can see that it was created before 1950. Um, but before we begin describing the mask, I'd like to talk a little bit about the region and the culture that it comes from. So if you could advance to the next slide, please, Ray. Um, if you keep in mind, when you look at the continent of Africa, um, it's a continent of 53 different countries. It's larger than the United States, China, and Brazil combined. And this mask comes from a very specific region. You can see um, it's located in the crook of the west coast of the continent, and it comes from a very specific culture, the Yoruba. Okay, go ahead, Ray. Thank you. Uh, as Dr. Nee pointed out, uh, the Igungun mask is a primary element of a really broad visual and audio sensory experience. Um, you can't talk about the mask without talking about the experience. The wearer's interaction with the audience uh, completely, it's so important because it aids in his communication with the spirit world and, the, and it's totally necessary for his transformation. Uh, the actual word igungun is defined as masquerade and as a mask covering the entire head and body of the wearer. And as we look at this slide and we see this, you know, massive fabric mask, one has to wonder uh, and I'm going to ask, like, Ray, if you wear this, how are you going to see? 
that that's a great question, Cindy, because uh, you can see up here there have this is where your face or eyes would be. And I'm not really sure. Maybe you can kind of see through it. There's, there's a gauze there. There's a gauze. Is yeah. it, it's a gauze? It's, yes. Yeah, it's a form of a mesh gauze so that the the wearer actually does have a way of seeing um, through this huge mask. And you, you can see it's made from exquisite cloth, you know, velvet, satins, and, and there are other materials that are added, like sometimes glass beads and different types of shells. They're all prestige ma materials. And this is what makes this mask come to life when it's worn. The strips of cloth, and they're known as lappets. They swirl away from the wearer as he twirls and dances, and it makes the mask extend way beyond the resting size. You know, so let's say if we look at the one that's on the right, if it was actually in performance, it would probably be three to four times the width that you see when it's at rest. Uh, although this type of masquerade is male dominated, women are important because they help to create the materials and they also are encouraged uh, they encourage the performer in the performance while they're watching um, as we said the performance can be used to assert influence and it can be used as a tool for social control so a few examples of that would be uh, used as ancestral reverence as we said before for the harnessing of spirits and the communication of messages maybe warnings and blessings this type of masquerade has been in practice for centuries. It continues to be performed today during festivals known as Odun Igungun. Uh, unlike most of the other DIA's African masks, this one is in toto. That's I-N-T-O-T-O. -O. And that term just means that we have all of it. Um, all of it exists as opposed to maybe just having a part of a mask. Uh, Jim, are you there, Jim? Wake up, Jim. Jim. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm here, Cindy. I was just listening. Jim, I want you to imagine a whole group of maskers wearing this masquerade outfit and twirling and whirling. What a, what a spectacle it would create. Wouldn't it be just, uh, not only the swirling, but the movements and, and the music accompaniment? It would it just just be the, the whole experience just would be overwhelming, wouldn't it? It would certainly be a spectacle. Uh, I encourage all the people who are listening today and viewing this virtual tour, uh, visit the DIA's African galleries. You can see a life-size video projection of the Egungun Masquerade in action. And it, it's it's really fabulous. You really can't imagine it. You have to see it. Um, I'm wondering, are there any questions regarding the Egungun mask? Not at this time. No. Okay, over to you, Jim. Thanks. Hey, Ray, would you mind going back to the map, please? Just back sure. to you. So we're going to be talking about Yoruba. And it has a history of urbanization that dates back to as early as the ninth century. The Yoruba speaking peoples today number about 25 million and occupy the southwestern parts of Nigeria and the southern parts of the Republic of Benin. For centuries, the Yoruba region has been divided into kingdoms, each with its own divine ruler of elders and chiefs though all sharing a similar religious, cultural, and artistic heritage. I'm going to be talking to you today about three art pieces from the Yoruba region. Our first piece is the Galade mask. Ray, could you switch back to the, thanks. This wooden mask would have been worn on top of the head like a bicycle helmet. And it's a superb example of an art form that is found almost exclusively among the Yoruba culture. A Galadi is a festival or masquerade performed in veneration of the society's women. Yoruba communities perform a Galadi masquerade annually, at which time they formally recognize the powers women have and solicit their benevolence to ensure the prosperity and harmony of the community. Many African cultures honor the important roles women play in society. 
In addition to bearing, raising, and nurturing children, women are critical to spiritual life. Women are the custodians of knowledge and can act as intermediaries with the spirit world. In Yoruba, women are believed to possess the power to influence all human activity for good and for ill. The reason for having the Galati Festival is so that women will feel appreciated and will use their spiritual powers towards the positive interests of society. Every woman, regardless of age, has a natural potential to perform wonders. The Yoruba culture respects the natural powers women have with the hope that they will use their powers responsibly and not create havoc. These powers only become stronger when, when a woman passes childbearing age. When past menopause, a woman becomes an elder and she has the greatest potential and she is really the most feared, though I believe the most respected within the community. This mask is an excellent example of a Galati mask. The masquerade is performed by groups of men wearing carved wooden body parts under their regalia to mimic the female form. The actual festival often takes place in the marketplace, the domain of women, and involves street orchestras, dance, music, singing, and drama, all designed to imitate the movements and gestures of women and to entertain the viewers, who are also integrated into the performance. The wooden helmet at the top of the masked dancer's head communicates women's power through their imagery. A headdress may symbolize a particular social role, status, or religious affiliation, and is part of a larger mixed media ensemble, including fabric, beads, and bones. Animal imagery is often incorporated into a mask and is used to represent women's spiritual powers and to serve as metaphors for human actions. As you can probably tell by now, all Galati masks have the face of a woman. This particular mask has a distinctive cap that is associated with warrior chiefs, an emblem of power. In real life, a warrior cap would never be worn by a woman. So when used in a mask like this, the significance becomes very powerful. Hey, Jim. Yeah, Ray. Uh, this looks like it's remnants of paint. Were these typically painted? They were as well. They were painted, yes. Um, originally, they were painted with elements they found within, within the area. Later on, um, when the Europeans introduced metal-based paint, um, the, the paint changed. But yes, they were painted. And as, as also looking at her face, she seems very serene, doesn't she, Ray? Demonstrating the timelessness of the spiritual world. While I'm talking about this mask, it reminds me that Valentine's Day is this Sunday. Ray, and I'm hoping you don't want to bring the havoc of, of your sweetheart with you and you've already got a gift for her. Jim, I was on the phone at 8.30 this morning to the florist. I'm all set. Great. I'd also like to wish Cindy, Kimmy, Amanda, and Christine, and everyone in our audience a happy Valentine's Day. Cindy, would you mind? We're going to go on to our next piece, and tell me what you what you see when you take a, when you look at it. Well, there's a lot going on here, Jim. Um, it looks like I see a hat at the top and it's resting on some kind of a structure. I think the person who's wearing the hat might be riding a horse. There are a lot of other people kind of in circumference around this primary person. And I'm wondering, like, how big is this thing? It's, it's really tall. It's 51 inches tall, Cindy, by 19 and a half inches by 20 and a half inches. And it's an EPA mask. It's a ceremonial mask worn by the Yoruba people of Nigeria during the EPA festival and pays tribute to the cultural renewal that accompanied the founding of the Akiti communities at the turn of the century. Individuals are recognized for achievements that relate to the community's development 
and are honored on this occasion and celebrated by a masquerade performance organized by their descendants. These rituals include monumental, as you can see here, sculpted headdresses featuring warriors, herbalists, female figures who are fundamental to the longevity of the community and Jim, other important Jim, ancestors. Jim, can I jump in right here? Yeah. Because I just, when you say monumental, I have to encourage people to go to the gallery and see this because I think it's misleading in this uh, picture. It looks maybe small, maybe it's a foot or two. It is very large. It's, it's in fact, it's so large, tall. it's impressive that someone is able to put it on their head. So let's take a look at this object. It was originally brightly painted. Traces of red, yellow, white, and blue can still be seen. The mask consists of two distinct parts. At the bottom is a double-faced figure containing almond-shaped eyes, square ears, and rectangular mouths. Above is an elaborately carved figurative superstructure, usually carved with either a female or in our case, an equestrian figure at its center. An equestrian figure represented an especially high status since horses are rare and were very costly to own. The smaller figure surrounding the ancestor on horseback represent his descendants, musicians, hunters, and others central to Yoruba community life. Up a mass are worn along with the elaborate regalia covering the performer's body and are worn exclusively by men in ceremonies. And these ceremonies are usually to promote the fertility and well-being of the community, to celebrate the return of warriors, to mark the growth of new crops and in post burial rites. Ray, can you switch the masquerade slide for me? In one episode of the festival, often occurring towards the end of the performance, the masquerader supporting a mask which can weigh, like in this case, more than 50 pounds, attempts to leap on or off a mound, often to foretell to the quality of the new year. A fall or loss of balance may be seen as a bad omen which may herald coming misfortune. When not worn in performances that are animated by dance, song, and musical accompaniment, all adding to the masquerade's overall experience. These towering structures are placed on altars and family shrines where they are the focus of offerings and prayers. In most cases, in almost all cases, the artists of these beautiful masks are anonymous, but for us, that is not the case. He is Bangboye of Odua Owa, who was a master of complex compositions Ray, can you slide, go down to a picture of him? There, right there, thank you. And he lived in the Akiti region of Yoruba, Nigeria, and lived from 1893 to 1978. And he was a master of complex compositions. Bengboye became renowned as the foremost designer, designer of the Ipa. The, if you can go back to maybe the mask showing a side view, the red, yellow, and blue pigments, um, as I mentioned, came from originally from local materials and later from European when they brought in metal-based paint. And although his composition consists of relatively static tiers of small secondary figures, their sheer number and diversity, as you can see, or see here, endow the work with a sense of dynamism and suggest a lively procession. And what is the most amazing to me is that this sculpture is carved from a single block of wood, most probably a roko, which is also known as African teak. Hey, Ray, I know I'm a little, you know, it's middle of winter and everything, but when uh, your children were young, did you ever go fishing with them? You bet. I bet you never caught a fish like our next object. I, why don't we switch on to our next object? Jim, this is scary. Hey, yep, hey, we don't find this in our lakes around here. Hey, Do you Jim, have any questions there, Kimmy? 
Yes, I do. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is actually something I would uh, like Dr. Nee to um, answer. Um, so one of our uh, guests is um, thinking about how museums obtain collections. Um, and I know that, you know, especially with our African collection, we're very aware of a lot of the provenance for the pieces that we have in our galleries. Um, however, some uh, one of our visitors is wondering, um, have we been um, active in reassessing our collection and thinking about, um, you know, how things might have been obtained during colonization periods? Y yes, we, we, we have started. Um, systematically going through the entire collection uh, to identify um, lapses in information um, gathering around some of the objects. We've also identified objects that were collected legitimately. So um, over time, we are going to be uh, looking very closely and very critically at um, some of the objects in the collection to see whether there's the, there's a need for us to um, um, to reach out to uh, to to communities or even um, to make sure that you no know, information about them are public enough so that people can see the information about them and if there are going to be issues surrounding their provenance, the museum will be very happy to uh, to discuss. At this moment, we are not trying to um, get rid of any objects, but um, we, for the sake of transparency, we are making um, the public, um, uh, we're giving the public access to the information we have about the objects in the collection. Um, we have to bear in mind that the DIA has been collecting African arts since the early part of the 20th century. The first objects that came into the collection um, go all the way back to about 1897. So um, we have lots and lots of um, very, very legitimately collected pieces in the collection. But you no, know, um, as we get closer and closer to the um, to the present moment, yes, um, we are going to be looking very, very seriously at the collection and the information that come with it. In fact, new objects that we are uh, collecting at the moment uh, go through rigorous provenance uh, research before we allow them into the collection. So um, we are doing due diligence um, and that is something that the museum is very serious about. Thank you so much, Dr. Nee. We appreciate it. Okay. Jim? So let's go back to this sort of terrifying fish, uh, if you don't mind, Ray. It's not on my screen, is it? It's 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 on the screen now. You can see it. it. Everyone, yes. it is. Hey Jim, yeah, we can see. Jim. I, I think everyone can see it. Maybe oh, it's oh, not coming for you, but everyone else can see it. Okay. Okay. This piece is from the Ibu culture located in southeast Nigeria, mainly within the large delta area formed by the many waterways, swamps, and streams of the Niger River. The Niger River Delta is a vast area consisting of over a thousand square miles and was a very harsh environment for the Ibu people in the pre-modern world. Due to the vast wetlands, it was very easy for one to become lost and even eaten as it contained many dangerous animals such as crocodiles. In the 15th century, when the Portuguese and other European nations started to arrive in the region, the Ibu and others residing along the coast became very important as trading brokers or intermediaries between the Europeans and the people living in the mainland. The water spirit mass we are looking at is a fanciful animal created from the art artist's imagination. This animal doesn't exist. It is an assemblage of some of the most ferocious and feared aquatic creatures that inhabited southern Nigeria in the Atlantic Ocean. The reason these sculptures are so popular is because the Ibu wanted to control and master the harsh environment in which they lived 
including even the spirits that resided in the streams and waterways of the Delta region. The people believe that since the water spirits are so dangerous, they needed to be harnessed and controlled so that their livelihood could be advanced, especially through their increasing trade practices. Through the performance of masquerade, the water spirits may reveal themselves to humans, offering humans the opportunity to interact and negotiate with those spirits. The strong tradition of water spirit masquerade has continued through even today and are performed annually or seasonally. In the front of our mask is the crocodile's mouth with its large menacing sharp teeth. Then you see the body of a fish with its protruding fins and fins along the top suggesting those of a shark. In addition, the artist has added mirrors and colored paint to enhance its overall effect. Unlike our last piece, in fact, actually our last two pieces, which were carved out of a single piece of wood, this sculpture has multiple pieces that have been literally stitched together. All these elements suggest a strong European influence. The idea of separate pieces being combined almost like almost form like a collage in the use of mirrors paint and the metal elements sticking out from the top of the mask are all products brought from europe at the bottom of the mask is a cap which goes on the head of the wearer there are holes around the rim of the cap used to attach the regalia the performer would have worn during the masquerade performances several people perform together using gestures to suggest the movements of the Walter spirits. And at this time, if there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna turn it back to Cindy, who has a story about a royal family that has fallen into some intrigue. Cindy, you're up. Jim, this is, thank you for your information. This is uh, a very large piece. Uh, it's, it is on display, and uh, it, again, just like the other piece that you previous, it's amazing that someone could have put it on their head. It's uh, really enormous. It is. It's 32 inches by over 100 inches long by 38 inches. It, it, it's just a huge piece. I don't know how you, a person, what skill, he, athleticism he must have had to be able to wear this and, 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 and perform the masquerade ceremony. It must have been an amazing feat of athleticism, Ray, which I don't think I have. And Thanks, when you Jeff. look at the base, when you look at the base, there is a cap-like formation underneath it with holes for articulating um, a very, you know, a large costume which would have covered the body of the wearer. So, um, as I said at the beginning, this is not a complete mask because it lacks the costume. With the, I mean, you can imagine how it would look like if it had the full costume, this full co uh, complement of um, wonderful, sometimes very colorful costume attached to it. Thank okay. you, Dr. Nee. Uh, any questions, Kimmy? Um, I think we'll hold off on uh, asking some questions for now, and if we have time at the end, we can maybe get to some of them, okay? Fantastic. Cindy, you're up. Thanks, Jim. Well, now we're going to talk about a love triangle. Uh, these three Cuba masks, I'm going to introduce you to this love triangle. The one on the left is Ngadi uh, Imwash. The one in the middle is Imwash uh, Imbui, and the one on the right is Imboom. And going forward, the one in the center I'll be referring to as Woot. So these come to us from Central Africa. Uh, it's a region that was once known as Zaire. Today, it is the Democratic Republic of Congo. And according to the oral history of the Kuba Kingdom, its founder, Woot, that's the one that we see in the, in the center, the mask in the center, uh, he came from outside the area and married his sister wife in Gadi. That's the one on the left. And that's how they started the royal line. So like the ancient Egyptians, the Kuba royal family practiced what we call endogamy. And this is intermarriage between close relatives. We know the Egyptians uh, practiced that to ensure what they felt was a, a pure bloodline 
I'm not certain why the Cuba did it. Perhaps Ni could um, expand upon that. I, I don't know if it was also for the purity of the bloodline. I suppose it's, it's, to, it's to reinforce the exclusivity of the um, of the of the uh, royal pedigree. You no, know, that's you no. Know, they they are a, a breed apart. You know, um, from the rest of the population because the rest of the population is the predominantly pygmy you know, population that lived on the land before the royal um, clan um, um, arrived. On, you know, in that area, so so the 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 what what they are trying to emphasize here is how exclusive, how exclusive, and how separate the royal you know, line is from the rest of the population. Put simply, thank you, Dr. Nee. And and today, uh, believe it or not, Cuba kings claim over 120 generations of direct descent from this couple. So I think what Dr. Nee was just explaining, it worked. <laughs> they kept themselves very apart and very, uh, very special. The third member of our story is Mboum, and he's the interloper of the love triangle. He's the one that Ray is so graciously pointing out for us. So the, this masquerade serves dual purposes. It's a reenactment of the origin story, reliving the story of love and power between the three. And it's also um, reenacted to strengthen the Cuba political structure, which is composed of the king and court elders. It's performed as a group masquerade for the investiture or another word we could use for that would be installation of the king or sometimes for the funeral of the elders. And Ray, if we would move on to the next um, slide. We'll start with Ngadi. So Ngadi is this refined, beautiful, royal woman. And if you, you know, we always do research before we do these talks. And if you were to go and look at any other museum that might have Cuba masks, the attributes that we see on these three masks remain the same. They're very strong, they're very specific. And if you walked into an African gallery and you know, after we've had this presentation today, you could walk in and say, that's Ngadi, that's Mwash, that's Mbui. You would know them right away. So she's the sister wife of Woot. And the materials that her, uh, this mask is made from illustrate her, uh, the wealth and ex exclusivity of the Cuba. From the 1700s to the 1800s, the Cuba were able to build great wealth. Um, they traded uh, with the Europeans and they traded for things like cowrie shells and glass beads. And these items were of such prestige and were so important that they were even used as currency um, along some of the coastal cultures. Remember, we're talking about um, South so, uh, sub-Saharan Central Africa. So this is a landlocked area, but along the coast, they actually use some of these materials as currency. You can see that there's a strip that runs down from between her eyes, over her nose and across her mouth. And there are a lot of um, uh, ideas of why, um, if we could go back, please. If uh, There are a lot of ideas why this exists, but uh, according to, the material that we use and that we have vetted for us through the DIA, we really don't know the exact reason. Uh, you can see that she's got these beautifully beaded eyebrows and then notice uh, where her where that piece of cloth is hanging. That's actually meant to be her ear. And you know, you could look at it and you can say, all right, Cindy, so what? There's a piece of cloth that is her ear, but there's so much more. This piece of cloth is, is actually what we call Cuba cloth. And it isn't made from raffia, woven raffia, which would be a little bit more primitive. This is actual cloth, which shows technological advancement and continues to reinforce the idea that she is a very refined woman. And then take a look at the triangular shapes that are on her forehead and the triangular shapes that are created by the cowrie shells that are on her cap. All of those things are identifiers or attributes that point us to the fact that this is in Gadi. And lastly, I would like to talk about the lines that you can see coming down on her cheeks. Those represent tears. And I knew someone would ask in the chat, why does she have tears? So I made sure I could answer the question before we started today. The tears refer to the hardships that women sometimes must face. Um, so uh, the attached body covering, as, as Dr. Nee said, all of these wooden masks had 
coverings that would cover the entire body of the wearer. In this case, uh, it would have also been decorated with shells and glass beads, and it would have included most likely slippers and hand coverings so that it could further conceal the wearer's identity because we know the wearer would have been a man and Ngati is meant, you know, meant to be known as a woman. Uh, if we could move to the next one, please. Thank you, Ray. So this is Imwash uh, Mbui or- um, Cindy, yes. I just want to correct you. Uh, this is not Mwash Mbui, this is Mochim. 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 Yes, Mochim. usually, in Mwash in Bui would have been used for the purpose, but Muchim is also used for the same ceremony sometimes. So the two are used interchangeably. So this specific mask is Muchim. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ni. Nee. Okay. So Muchim, who we also call Woot, um, he was the founder and the creator of the royal dynasty of the Kuba. And, you know, as I'm looking at this, I wanted to ask you, Ray, what is coming out of the top of his head? It is fascinating and distinctive. You, and it, it looks like it's made of shells, uh, the Kauri shells and, and the beads that we were just talking about. Uh, and it, it looks like it has feathers here. It obviously is, symbolizes something significant to their culture. Well, you can see that this mask would have taken many, many hours of work to create. You know, it's completely covered with decoration. And the projection from the top of the head is a reference to the elephant. And it aligns the king with the elephant's attributes of being very wise and also being capable of brute force. So, you know, they're saying when someone wears this mask and during the masquerade, uh, this would reinforce the idea that the royal dynasty is in charge. The interlace motif that you can see in the middle of that, uh, some, the, the projection that we kind of say looks like an elephant's trunk, that motif is also reserved for the king and alludes to the king's royal power. The red feathers that you mentioned come from the tail of a parrot, and we know that a parrot is a sky or a celestial creature. And here, the feathers represent the ability of the king to communicate with the spirit world. And notice on the left side, there's a puff of kind of raffia. Um, this is only part of what would have been a full collar that would have gone all the way around the bottom of that. It would have had a big full raffia collar. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, this has to fit over someone's head. It's really large, including that, that you know, the kind of the elephant shaped trunk. This is a huge mask and it really is spectacular. And the DIA is fortunate enough to have all three of the masks of this origin story. You can walk into a lot of museums and you might see Woot and you might see Ngati, but you rarely would see all three of them together. So we are very fortunate to have them. Um, Cindy, it's interesting that this strip is also on the uh, this uh, mask. Yes, same strip that we see go going between um, the eyebrows over the nose and then down over the mouth. And this one also um, is part of a larger mask. And the rest of this mask most often might have been made of leopard skins. And the leopard skin is uh, the pelts of a leopard were reserved for the king and for the leader. So they might be used to uh, be worn as a cape or he might use them to lay over his throne but uh, you know no one else could wear leopard but the king so this one has so many visual cues that you would know that who's ever wearing this represents the king did the king ever wear this mask from what i know the answer to that is no it would have been worn only by someone selected by the king to represent him am i correct in that dr knee yes the queen the king does not wear this mask it's performed by other people but one of the things I want to point out is um, the profusion of um, um, I, uh, cowrie shells as well as um, the small beads that you see on the surface all point to the economic power wielded by the king because cowrie shells were in the past, at least in, you know, in pre 20th century times, used as currency. So it's a reference, direct reference to the wealth of the court. And then the beads that you see, the small beads, which we call seed beads or trade beads, were traded over long distances and they were tied to the European presence. And therefore, 
there is a clear you know, connection with you know, and the European trade you know, alluded to in the um, in the in the masks. And um, I think that you know um, these are among the various vi visual cues that you know the mask is uh, is is designed to send uh, out to the public, you know, to viewers when they see the mask in performance. And it is absolutely important for us to also you know understand that while the mask is performing to celebrate or reenact a particular myth in Cuba culture, there are also powerful messages that it is sending about the capacity of the royal family, you know, the economic capacity of the royal family, so to speak. OK, next. Hey, oh, wait, one second, Dr. Ni. Nee. Um, uh, since you were kind of talking a little bit about the topic of um, the presence of Europeans, um, we did have a question specifically about this mask, um, asking about, um, you know, uh, the the introduction of metal-based paints, and um, the the viewers just wondering, you know, number one, if the technique to paint had already been present before that type of material was introduced, and also just you know wondering about, you know, the fact that they the metal-based paints would have been present. Well, we, we've had um, various types of pigments used all over Sub-Saharan Africa for a long time before Europeans showed up. Um, indigo, for instance, uh, was widely used, um, um, but there were also um, kaolin, which is, uh, which is a, a natural material in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as um, um, Steata and uh, hematite, hematite, which is red, as well as um, um, tree bark, you no know, dyes that were also used. So, you know, Sub Saharan Africa has had lots and lots of pigments that have been used, you know, um, in decorating masks for a long time. Um, the European paints came in sometime in the late 19th century, between 1850 and 1950, we saw the uh, increased importation of European paints, which um, um, Africans found to be not just um, permanent uh, when used, but also uh, came with um, a more variety in, in terms of you know, the, the, all the different shades of paints which uh, were imported into Africa. Many of the local paints did not provide the same um, variety and therefore, um, uh, you know, the European paints became very, very, um, uh, very popular. However, in certain mask forms and certain art objects, um, European paints were not allowed at all because the local paints, the local pigments had specific symbolic associations which made them critical for in the decoration of um, masks, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't put too much of uh, a weight on the European imported paints. I think that it all varies from um, one culture to the other. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nee. That was a wonderful explanation. Cindy, um, we've got maybe just 60 seconds on this. I can do it in a minute, Ray. I can do it. So lastly, um, the last member of the love triangle is in boom and he was the interloper into the relationship who tried to steal Ngadi from Moot. He was an aboriginal pygmy and he was local a local of the Kuba region. So this mask is made from materials that set him apart from the royal couple such as it's covered with copper sheeting and that would have had to come from a neighboring area and was not natural to the environment so that set him apart. Um, the use of raffia cloth his overhanging forehead, and you can see he's got hyena hair and a hyena fur beard. That also allude to him being more crude or primitive than the refined Ngadi or the very powerful Woot. Um, as we said before, many other museums have examples of one or two Cuba masks, but the DIA has all three. So I invite you to once again, come to our African galleries and see them in person. And with only a few days till the American Valentine's Day holiday, I think it was kind of fitting that we had this love triangle to talk about. <laughs> Do we have any questions before we move on and wrap up with Dr. Nee? No questions. Okay, Dr. Nee. Yes. Um, um, this mask called 
Mabu, was originally the property of the Quifon, an organization that counts among its members the most influential people in Kom society. The Kom people of the Republic of Cameroon live in a centralized political system headed by a king who occupies the apex of a hierarchy of office holders. The king and nobles are members of the Quifoin, which strives to ensure smooth governance of the kingdom. To achieve these goals, the Quifoin plays a central role not only in kinship investiture and law enforcement, but also it provides another functioning arm of government. The mass, uh, a, work, a work of remarkable force and presence, this Mabu mask was for more than a century owned um, strictly by the Quifoin society. And the Quifoin members thought of the mask as a symbol of their privilege and prestige in Cuba culture. In Cuba, in, as such, whenever the mask performed, it was restricted to very, very solemn occasion. One of the solemn occasions is the inauguration of kings. Another is the royal ancestral rituals that were performed uh, occasionally. And then during the funerals of high level members of the Com society. Next slide. While the Com kings kingship does not directly own the mask, the two branches, that is the Quifoin society, as well as the kingship, work very closely together to ensure the king's coercive powers. And the mask is the facilitator of that. The mask is what actually helps to enforce the king's coercive powers. It carries out summons for lawbreakers, you know, and it has, it's also helps in adjudicating important disputes. It can also execute you know, people. They, they can, people can be arrested by the, um, by the mask um, when the Quifoin is authorized to execute somebody. Generally, the mask is called a monkey mask, but when you look at it very closely, you'll find that it probably just depicts the chimpanzee, given its massive overhanging eyebrows and prominent teeth. We do not know exactly what the symbolic significance of what the symbolic significance of the um, of the chimpanzee is to the Quifoin society. Similarly, the identities of the three figures, three mammals on top of the mask, forward-facing mammals on top of the mask, are unknown. They may be leopards or hyenas. Both the leopard and the hyena is considered a powerful predator and therefore might allude to the Quipoin's regulatory powers. The beauty of this mask is that, is that unlike others that have been collected by other museums, this one has got all of its beadwork, you know, its beadwork decoration you know, intact. You can see on the left slide that it has these long tubular glass beads, which are indigenous to the area, and they were they are highly valued um, beads. Some of these beads sold on the market individually can cost anywhere between a hundred dollars and hundred and fifty dollars for one. In addition, you see the same seed beads that we saw in the Cuba masks. That is also part of the trade. So the presence of these beads around the entire mask, especially around the backside of the mask, is a clear reference to the wealth of the Quiforn society, which is um, which, which boasts uh, among its members 
not just the king, but very, very important nobles who are themselves very, very, um, uh, very wealthy. The mask is worn over the head like a helmet. So the person wearing the mask would have looked through the mouth, um, through the mouth behind, you know, uh, behind uh, the, um, the, 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 the very, very strong teeth of the, of the mask. Um, next slide. As I said, this is a special mask in the African gallery, not only because um, it is an old mask, which we know comes all the way from, all the way back, you know, dates all the way back to the 19th century, but also because of the special circumstances under which, you know, uh, we acquired this mask. Um, the mask was purchased from a European dealer, and there is a story behind its acquisition. But what is interesting about it is that when you look on the right, you see that same mask photographed in situ by an anthropologist in 1976. The anthropologist was Pierre Harter, who published a book on Cameroonian, uh, ancient Cameroonian, Cameroonian art, and uh, it shows the, a new king of, um, of uh, Kom called King Jinabo II at his 1976 public inauguration. The king is standing to his left or to the right, if you are looking at the picture, are three, um, three um, uh, beaded sculptures which represent the royal ancestors. And then to the left is the mask. This is the only mask that is present in this particular frame. What is critical is that at the time the DIA purchased the investigation into the provenance, and this is where you see how you know, um, the DIA is serious about provenance, the provenance that we received for this mask was that after this particular ceremony, not long after this particular ceremony, a member of the royal family um, took the mask to Belgium, sold the mask because they needed to raise money for a major funeral um, in Combe society. And so we have it on record that the dealer acquired the mask legitimately from a member of the Combe royal family. When we acquired the mask, it did not come with its accompanying costume. But the DIA got lucky because about six months prior to acquiring the mask, a local collector with my help um, decided that he had found something very interesting in the hands of an African dealer, which was the feathered costume that looks similar to the feathered costume that the mask, the mask is wearing in the photograph. We, I actually helped the local collector buy the costume, hoping that the costume would eventually be donated to the DIX collection. When we acquired the mask, and I saw the photograph of the mask in situ and realized that the mask I was wearing a similar costume, feathered costume. I went back to the local collector and begged him, really, you can imagine me literally on my knees begging him <laughs> to give us this wonderful um, uh, feathered costume. And he was delighted to do so because I made a very convincing you know, point you know, that the two of them belong together. So when you come to the DIA, you find not just the mask standing all by itself, but also um, paired with um, a wonderful costume, which is just the right costume for it. We are not saying that it is the original costume because the feathered costume was used widely in that grassland region of Cameroon. But we are really, really excited that we can pair the two and at least to give the visitor 
to the African gallery. Um, some insight into how the mask would have appeared in public in its original context in Com society. So we are fortunate to have a mask like this type. We are fortunate to have a mask that has great provenance. We are also fortunate to have the mask documented in the photograph going back to 1976, which reassures us that we are looking at an authentic piece that was used perhaps extensively over a century for important ceremonies like the one we're witnessing. So the mask is there, like the three sculptures, to witness an important you know, installation of, of a chief, which is considered a very solemn occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nee. Uh, Kim, Kimmy, is there a question that uh, we have time for a question for Dr. Nee if there, there is one? Um, I, I think that we've had a lot of questions that, you know, maybe Dr. Nee might be able to speak on just how some of these um, masks were actually kept on people while they were moving around them. We've had a couple of questions just asking about, you know, how are they kept on some a person um, and, you know, especially while they're moving? Well, one, one of the tricks that Africans um, develop is to be able to put um, a string, you know, a string inside the mask that is tied from one corner of the inside to the other that the person wearing the mask will bite on when he's, he, he's dancing the mask vigorously. So the mask is never going to slip off. Sometimes when the person wears them, there is a way for them to hold onto the mask physically with their hands inside the costume. So there are ways uh, by which, you know, um, you know the, the, mask, the, the person wearing the, the mask can keep the mask on without um, the mask falling off. But some of the masks too, um, we have masks in Africa that cover the entire body with, the, with, the, with no space for the mask to actually see outside. And that is interesting because then the mask is led around the arena with a bell. So the mask follows the bell, the direction of the bell, the sound of the bell. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, nee. uh Kimmy, do you have one more comment? Unfortunately, we have to, our time has expired here. Yeah, uh, Dr. Nee, I just wanted to let you know that we had several people say that they really enjoyed the um, uh, exhibition that you had put together called uh, Through African Eyes. And you have several people who really appreciated the work that you did and um, the fact that they really feel like they learned a lot from um, the exhibit that you put together. Oh, thank you very, very much. And I thank all of them. And if they if they can do me a favor, please come to the DIA. We have wonderful stuff to show you. That's all I can say. Thanks so much, Dr. Ni. Nee. And uh, the piece that Dr. Ni nee was just discussing, uh, the chimpanzee mask with its entire costume is uh, currently on display. And you can see in the, back, in the background that the uh, water spirit mask that Jim was talking about is right next to it. So um, we, I wanted to let you know that this is unfortunately the end of our presentation today. Uh, the DIA and Thursday at the Museum will continue with its celebration of Black History Month with two more presentations on Thursday. Next Thursday, February 28th, will be the second part of In Their Own Voice, which is a virtual tour of selected works of the DIA, um, selected African American works of the DIA. And we're so excited that the curator for that gallery Valerie Mercer will be joining us. Two weeks from today, on February 25th, Thursdays at the museum, we'll be presenting the 1968 film Mandabe by Senegalese um, writer and director Osman Sambi. I'm hoping I said that right, Dr. Nee. Osman Sambini. Sambini. Osman Sambini. It's a pleasure to have Dr. Nee with us. 
Um, and it's based on a book that he wrote called The Money Order. And it deals with uh, the economics and social conditions um, at the time. So in the meantime, thank you, Dr. Nee. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Amanda. And thanks, Kimmy. And for everyone, uh, hopefully we'll see you again next week. And please stay safe.